Welcome to the Sporty Sibling Podcast. Where we score touchdowns and make bad It's a trio. Trio drives down and throws it down. Oh, Alonzo Trio. Today they're going to match off and talk about. Welcome to this week's edition of the Sporty Saving Podcast, where we bring you the latest news and analysis from all the world of sports. In today's episode, we are going to cover, we have much to cover. First and foremost, we're going to start in the NFL with Brett Favre's welfare case, which has been making headlines recently. The former NFL quarterback is facing allegations that he accepted $1.1 million in welfare payments for work he actually never performed. This severe accusation has raised questions about not only the integrity of the welfare system and the ethics of high-profile individuals, such as Brett Favre. We'll discuss the latest developments in this case and examine the broader applications of this controversy. Number two, we're moving on to the world of sports, I mean the world of soccer, sorry. The future of two, sport, of, two of the sport's biggest stars is in question here. Lionel Messi and Neymar Jr. And it's up in the air. Messi, who has spent his entire career at Barcelona and PSG, is a free agent and has been linked to several top clubs. Meanwhile, Neymar, who currently plays for PSG still and is still technically under contract, has been rumored <coughs> to be considering a move back to his former club, Barcelona. <gasps> oh, the dirt! <laughs> We'll be analyzing the potential destinations for these two superstars and examining their moves, what their moves could mean for their respective teams and wider soccer world, of course, themselves as well. Finally, which is the utmost important one, I think, out of this whole situation, we will discuss the exciting National Women's Soccer League expansion plan. The NWSL has been growing in popularity in recent years. And with the addition of two new teams, Angel City FC and San Diego Wave FC, the league is poised for even greater success. We'll discuss what these new teams bring to the table, how they will impact the league's existing franchises, and what this exa- expansion means for women's soccer in the United States and beyond. So sit back, take a chill pill, relax, and get ready for not only an informative, but also an entertaining discussion on some of the hottest topics in the world of sports. Whether, and just remember guys, whether you're a diehard fan or a casual observer, there's something for everyone in this week's edition of the Sporty Civilian Podcast. So Panda, take us to our first topic. Thank you for that, Panda. And for those listening, we are going to be talking about the Brett Favre felt work case. So, a little introduction on this. Brett Favre is a former NFL quarterback who played for the Green Bay Packers, New York Jets, and the Minnesota Vikings. He is considered one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history, having won three NFL MVPs and led the Packers to a Super Bowl victory. However, in 2019, Favre became embroiled in a controversy over his involvement with the Mississippi Department of Human Services, MDHS, and the Mississippi Community Education Center, MCEC, in relation to the misappropriation of welfare funds. So some background on this. To understand the Brett Favre Mississippi state welfare case, we need to first understand the welfare system in Mississippi, who holds one of the uh, highest welfare welfare, um, percentages in the United States. The welfare system is designed to help low-income families and individuals by providing financial assistance for basic needs such as food, housing, and health care. The MDHS is responsible for administrating the welfare program in Mississippi, while nonprofit organizations such as MCEC are responsible for distributing the funds. Right? Self-explanatory, guys. That's kind of the background on the, um, you know, on the welfare system in Mississippi. Basically, one gets the funds, the other one distributes the funds. Right? Everyone gets it. Now, let's get into the actual incident and why all this is happening. 
So back in 2019, it was reported that Brett Favre had received $1.1 million in welfare funds from the MDHS for speaking engagements and appearances. Thus, this, thus you know, why he got them. But these funds were part of more extensive $94 million welfare program aimed at providing assistance to low-income families, meaning that he got this, uh, he got the $1.1 million from money that was supposed to be used for welfare programs, okay? Now, however, it was alleged that Favre actually still needed to complete the speaking engagements and appearances, and the funds, funds were instead used for personal gain. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, he got $1.1 million from 94 million welfare program for supposedly coming in and speaking and appearing in some in some events that he never actually did which in turn is illegal you need if you're getting paid for something you need to go and get it no plain and simple right pretty self-explanatory so what is the fallout out of this the news of Favre's involvement with the welfare fund caused a public outcry and, investi and, and investigation was launched. The investigation revealed that MCEC had also misused millions of dollars of welfare funds, including payment, paying its executive large salaries and purchasing luxury cars and other personal items. In other words, they were using this $94 million for themselves instead of others. As a result... The state of Mississippi demanded far return the $1.1 million in welfare funds he received, and he eventually paid back $500,000. The MCEC and its executives were also charged with various crimes, including embezzlement and fraud. But let's analyze truly what happened here. So, three things to analyze, okay? The Brett Favre Mississippi State welfare case really opened up a can of worms and highlighted several issues uh, within the welfare system in Mississippi, amongst other states, because I'm sure this is something that happens everywhere. So first, it showed that Mississippi is vulnerable. The system, I'm sorry, is vulnerable for to misuse and abuse, as seen in the case of MCEC and its executives. The case of MCEC and its executives highlights the vulnerability of the system and misuse and abuse. The actions of its executives demonstrate how individuals with power can manipulate the system for personal gain. This underscores the importance of checks and balances to ensure that power it is not concentrated in the hands of a few. We've seen this all over. It also highlights the need to, for accountability and transparency in institutions to prevent corruption and maintain the public trust. Highlight that public trust. The second thing. It raises concerns about the responsibilities of public public figures and organizations to use welfare funds appropriately and transparently. Again, transparently is going to be going around a lot in this. Okay, the misuse of the welfare funds by public figures in organizations raises significant concerns about their responsibility to use such funds appropriately. These funds are intended for crucial support to vulnerable members of society. As somebody that was in the welfare system that understands that, you know, I not always had something to eat. This is important. I should be able to trust organizations that are out here to help me. Therefore, it is imperative that those entrusted with the welfare funds act with integrity and accountability and transparency. That word again, transparency. And accountability to ensure that these funds are effectively used for their intended purposes. And third, it under, underscores the importance of accountability and an oversight in ensuring that welfare funds are used for an intended purpose. Again, feeding one right and the other, ladies and gentlemen. I don't just do this for fun. I do my research. This, you know, everything connects. Also, I was a really good creative writer so and researcher, so it works out. But the misuse of welfare funds highlights the highlights a critical role of accountability and oversight in ensuring that these funds are are used for its intended purpose. Such oversight is necessary to prevent the diversion of funds towards personal gain or otherwise unauthorized usage. In other words, if we don't keep this up, people are going to keep doing things like this, 
instead of tailing it to people that actually need it. Effective oversight mechanisms can also help to detect and deter fraudulent activities, thereby pro protecting vulnerable beneficiaries. Again, in other words, if we don't create something to put together, okay, to be able to say, hey, you shouldn't be doing this for that, then no one that actually needs it is going to get the money. We need to ensure transparency, accountability, and effectiveness in this situation. Now, in conclusion, the Brett Favre Mississippi State Welfare case is a reminder the importance of transparency, accountability, and checks and balances in public in using public funds. While the welfare system is designed to help those in need, it is only effective, ladies and gentlemen, if the funds are used appropriately and for intent, its intended purpose. The case also highlights the need for continued scrutiny and oversight of the welfare system to prevent future abuse and ensure that funds reach those who genuinely need it. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm basically trying to say is that we need to look at the welfare system, redo it, relook at it, put, put in checks and balances so that people that actually need this money that actually will benefit from having this money will actually get it and will have that help for the future. Because if we don't do that, then what's the point of all this? Brett Favre really showed and really put this out there and was able to catch. Now, whether Brett Favre actually was part of this or not, because this goes in deeper, I just, I just kind of went on the outside of it. This also shows, and something that I, I kind of wasn't gonna um, wasn't gonna really put in here, but you know, I kind of I figured it's better. You know, actions of Brett Favre also hurts the public trust in the system and individuals responsible for administrating and public figures like Brett Favre. So we need to put a lot of checks and balance here, ladies and gentlemen. So that we can go ahead and help out those in need. Otherwise, what are we doing? Right? We need to. We need to continue helping those that, in, that are in need. For sure, 110%. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is just one of those cases that you know, we, we just got have to keep track of. I, I don't know what more I can say that... I hope Brett Favre wasn't truly involved and he actually did make those engagements. But if he's not, he should be ashamed of himself. Again, as a kid that has been on welfare, knows people on welfare. But that's the alarm. Panda, take us to our next topic. Thank you for that, Panda. And for those listening, topic numero dos is we're going to talk about where should Messi play next? So, Lionel Messi is now arguably the greatest soccer player to play the Gorilla Sports. He's won every major award, tournament, and has finally won the World Cup. That, that was a top year. He finally got it. So, Lionel Messi's contract with PSG still needs to be done. He's currently on the contract for the rest of this year and this season. Okay? With that said, Lionel Messi's next destination after his stint in PSG is still up in the air, given that his long and sturdy history with Barcelona. Now, I'm gonna put in I'm gonna add to this stating that we know what the Saudis are giving him. It's like four hundred and four million a year. Okay? And in all arguments, yeah, he's probably gonna end up going there. There's nothing left for him to play for but you know, money. He's won everything else. Why not just go get money? But this situation is more of to say, hey, maybe you should come play somewhere else. Let me give you my two cents on when where he should play outside of... Basically, I'm taking the Saudis out of the equation and opening it up for everybody else. Okay? So the question of where should... Where he should play next is not only about finding the right fit for him as a player, but also the legacy he will leave behind. 
So firstly, let us consider the clubs that could afford signing Messi. Manchester City, Chelsea, the, and an MLS team in America, such as Inter Miami, New York City FC, are just some of the potential destinations. Manchester City is one of the most likely options given its financial resources and past relationship with Messi's former coach, Pep uh, Guardiola, Guardiola. Sorry, Chelsea is another club in a financial power to sign Messi, and they have shown in recent years they were willing to spend big money to bring top talent in. Now, MLS teams are also a possibility with several franchises expressing interest in signing Messi in the past and have the financial backing to do so, such as, again, Miami Intern or uh, New York City FC. Intern Miami, I'm sorry, or even LA Galaxy. But to me, all, although all those are actually plausible, there's only one place Messi should go. Messi to continue his career in the United States, specifically with one of the MLS teams. While this may seem like a controversial choice, given that the standard of football in MLS compared to Europe's top leagues, uh, there are several, no, I'm, I'm sorry, compared to the European leagues, the standards are a little lower. There are several compelling reasons why it should be a good move for Messi. It could be a good move for Me Messi. First, Playing in the MLS would offer Messi a new challenge and allow him to expand his horizons. He has spent his entire career in Europe, and while he has played against some of the best teams and players from around the world, the MLS would offer a different kind of competition. He would be playing in a league that, will st that is still growing and developing, and he would have the opportunity to help raise the level of playing in the league. Secondly, playing in the MLS would allow Messi to leave a lasting legacy in America, in American soccer. The sport has been growing in popularity here in the United States, and Messi's presence would undoubtedly draw more attention to the league, which is what we want. His signing would be a massive coup for any MLS team, and it would help cement the league's reputation as a growing and exciting football destination for many European powerhouses. And since he's still pretty young, this would be a benefit to MLS. <laughs> Lastly, moving to MLS would allow Messi to continue his career at least in uh, past his, his current age. He's already 34 years old. And while he has shown that he's still one of the best players in the world, he may not be able to maintain that level of play at the highest level of European football forever. No, it happens. Our bodies decline. What, you know, father time. Playing in the MLS would allow him to play a slightly slower pace, which would help prolong his career and keep him healthy, which is what he wants to do. He wants to stay healthy. Staying healthy would be the best situation for him right now and would allow him to prolong his career. And I mean, last time I checked, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants him to prolong his career. Shit, I want him to prolong his career. If he can play into his 40s, two, three years at MLS would allow him to do that. Just saying. Uh, of course, as in everything, there are potential drawbacks to Messi moving to MLS. Like we said, the standard of play is lower than in Europe. No, but again, what you expect? We haven't been around as long as the European leagues. Okay, we, we gotta grow. We gotta we gotta work at it. All right. The traveling schedule for MLS is tends to be a grueling one. Okay. Uh, I believe it was Philadelphia Union that traveled like in like six months. They travel from uh, Philadelphia to St. Louis to um, Chicago to Dallas to L.A. twice back to Philly, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, I think they traveled somewhere up, up 11,000 miles. You know, basically they had a lot of freaking uh, freaking flyer miles, which, again, that's not a bad thing. But at the same time, too, you know, it, that, that's a lot. And and if you're doing it, if you're playing on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, that that's a lot of traveling. 
That, that takes a toll. Can he do it? I mean, I think so. I mean, he has the money for recuperation and things like that. So, I mean, it's, I think out of everything that he's getting, it's not that, that's probably one of the worst things that could happen. But, like I said, however, all that stuff is true. To me, the positives of playing in the United States for Messi outweigh the negatives. The negatives is just that the standards are lower. Not much lower, just lower, but we're trying to get up there, which Messi will help. And the schedule, the travel schedule can be a little bit grueling. And I get that. But that's it. It, it just means that you're going to have to take maybe one day, one game off every now and then to recuperate, to get healthy. You're going to have to work a little more on your body, which, again, in the long run, really, if you think about it, if you can recuperate from this kind of traveling, when you go back to, to Europe, boom. It's like nothing. It's like, oh, we're only traveling. One. Oh, wow, I, my body still feels great. I can go play. I can play three matches right now. Seems like a no-brainer to me, ladies and gentlemen. In all honesty, it really does. And again, you know, you got to outweigh the negatives and the positives. And, you know, lasting legacy, just a future, health. How can you say no to that stuff? I mean, that's just me. Now, in, in conclusion, Lionel Messi is one of the greatest footballers ever. No one can argue that. And deciding where should where he should play next is essential to the world. We need to know where he's going to go. And I mean, again, in, in facts lie that he's going to go to the Saudis. We, we all know it. We all see it coming. I mean, if the Saudis were offering me one million a year, I would go. But... You know, four hundred and four million a year. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not even packing bags. Like I'm on a plane yesterday just to get there. But knowing where he's gonna play next is truly essential for us. While several clubs could afford to sign him, which is true, we we point them all out. He should consider playing for the MLS. It would offer him a new challenge, allow him to leave a lasting legacy in American soccer and in European soccer and just soccer in general, and provide him with the opportunity to prolong his career, which is what he wants. I, we all know that. Ultimately, however, the decision will be up to Messi, and it is clear that whether he goes, wherever he goes, I'm sorry, he will continue to be a force to be reckoned with on the football pitch. That is a no doubt in all of our minds that wherever this young man goes, he's going to be a monster. I mean, really at this point, I think he needs to start thinking about his health, prolong his career, and maybe he'll play with his kids one day. Who knows? Or, you know, maybe he just, you know, something like that. But thank you, Panda. Take us to our next topic. Thank you for that, Panda. For those listening, we're going to be talking about where should Neymar play next. So, Neymar Jr. is one of the most talented footballers in the world, as we know. With his, He has the skills of speed, scoring ability, and arguably has become one of the most sought-after players in the world. I mean... It's true. He's not messy, but he's still one of the top players in the world. So Neymar has played for several top teams in his career, including Barcelona and obviously PSG. However, reports say that he's recently announced his desire to leave PSG. Now, he said he would like to leave. That doesn't mean he's going to leave. He just would like to leave <clears throat> PSG, which... Sparks something in my mind, my speculation uh, for his future. So let's go ahead and talk about his potential destinations for Neymar and discuss which teams would best fit him. And I think you guys are going to be surprised by some of my, my picks. So let's start with number one. First and foremost, it is essential to understand why Neymar wants to leave PSG. Despite winning several domestic titles in the French, with the French Giants, Neymar has yet to lead them to a UEFA Champions League title. 
the most, uh, arguably one of the most coveted prizes in European club football. Additionally, Neymar has been plagued with plagued by injuries during his time in, P in Paris, which has limited his playing time and prevented him from reaching his full potential with the team. So, arguably, it might be his injuries and the fact that they can't get to a champions, uh, get a title. You know, might be time for a change vote for the team and for Neymar. Now, where should he land? Where should he go? Now, I'm treating Neymar me different than Messi because Neymar doesn't have a World Cup, doesn't have the titles that uh, Messi has, but Neymar is still a top player. So, and he's a little younger. He's only 31. So, one potential destination for Neymar is to return to his former club, Barcelona. Neymar played for Barcelona from 2013 to 2017 and formed one of the deadliest attacking trios with Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez. I loved watching this three men play. It was amazing. No one could stop them. They, they just knew how to get to the goal. It was just mwah, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay? However, there is a problem here. Barcelona is facing financial difficulties and may need help paying Neymar's high wages and transfer fees. All right, that's the question here. Can they afford to do all this? No. Also, Barcel Barcelona is currently rebuilding, which is not a bad thing at all. It's just, can they afford to rebuild the team and then get a player like Neymar? The benefits of getting Neymar to a rebuilding team is that it adds a boost a much needed boost in the attack where arguably they are the weakest at. So again, could they afford him? I don't know. Do they need him? Will it help the rebuild? Hell yes. Another potential destination for Neymar is Real Madrid. Now, Real Madrid is one of the biggest clubs in the world and has a history of signing some of the biggest names in football. Neymar would undoubtedly add to Real Madrid's attacking power and help them compete with their arch rivals, Barcelona, you know, as he seen. However, here's the problem. There are concerns, and I share these concerns, that Neymar may need to be a better fit for Real, Madrid, Real Madrid's team culture, which, again, nothing against Neymar, but the culture in at Madrid is strongly emphasized in teamwork and humility, which personally I have never seen from Neymar. So he can be as great as he can be, but if he's not humble, if he's not working as a team, is he really going to fit here? They can afford him, but is he worth the risk of destroying a culture that, that's already built them? And they're playing pretty good this year. So it's kind of like, ah, what they should do. A third potential destination for Neymar, and this is my dark horse, as a, one of my dark horses as I was looking through them, is Manchester City. So Manchester City is currently one of the strongest teams in the world and has one of the best managers in Pep Guardiola, Neymar's old, um, old coach. So Neymar would be able to fit nicely with the Manchester City's attacking style of play. Okay, so right now they have the money. They have they have the they, they obviously they have the style. They have the money. Is it worth it though? Okay, now again, they can afford them everything. They do. However, Neymar may need help to adapt to the physicality and intensity of the English Premier League. That's a whole different thing than when he's been at in PSG. All right. Which, again, I've said this before, is widely considered one of the world's most competitive leagues. So, the physicality is a lot more, the intensity is a lot higher. Can Neymar stay healthy and be back to his younger self to be able to do that? Because right now, when you're looking at everything, you know, Neymar's, if he wants to stay in Europe... Name, playing for Manchester City is the, really the only place where he can stay, where he can afford him. He has a coach that he knows, he feels comfortable with, and actually wants him. Outside of that, you know, Real Madrid has can afford him, but has issues with the culture. Barcelona wants him, but can afford him. Everywhere else, 
Manchester City is really the only place, assuming he wants to stay in Europe, that it's really all on on Neymar. If Neymar can be back to his younger, more virile self, this could be a positive win for him and Manchester City. I mean, I, I, could, I could potentially see myself betting on him just to, you know, please myself. If he decides to go there, it's considering that they, um, well, that they, they can get him. Now, my fourth, my, my fourth, uh, dark, my fourth, uh, place here is my dark horse. And I'm putting him them because it, it's obvious that this should be an option. And I can't believe more people aren't giving this an option. Okay, coming to play for MLS, enter Miami, New York FC, Galaxy, LAFC, all those teams would be a great fit for him. But again, positives and negatives, positives. He could like Messi, he could expand his horizons. No, it would challenge him even more. All right. He again, different competitions opportunity to help raise those opportunities no his legacy could be increased by saying hey i helped this organization boost up bigger than european leagues or to the level of the european leagues that was my doing thanks to me mls is what it is today but more importantly like with messi he's 31 that's old and he has a lot of injuries the lower pace of playing with the MLS would allow him to, you know, stay healthy for longer periods of time and keep him healthy for longer periods of time and allow him to recuperate for you no know, from the current injuries that he has. And again, we still have to look at the grueling uh, travel schedule and obviously you no know, the standard play is lower than what he's used to. But in reality, MLS is a perfect spot for him. But in conclusion, Neymar Jr. is one of the most talented footballers in the world, and his decision to leave PSG is has sparked much speculation about his future. While there are several potential destinations for Neymar, each with its advantages and disadvantages, the best fit for him is still questionable. However, whether or not the move is... Thank you for that. Whether or not the move happens or... Is remain to be seen, and we will wait to see uh, where Neymar ultimately ends up. Panda, thank you for that. Let's go on to our next topic. Thank you, Panda. And for those listening, we are going to be talking about the NWSL ex- expansion plan. Let us get started. So, the National Women's Soccer League, or NWSL, is the top professional women's soccer league in the United States and Canada, featuring some of the best female soccer players in the world. And in recent years, the league has grown in popularity, attracting more fans and sponsors, which is great, positive, and I love this. In recent years, though, the league has grown, um, and although the league has grown in popularity and att- with attracting more sponsors, they want continued growth. The NWSL has announced a 16-team expansion plan that will see the league nearly double. The 16-team expansion plan is a significant milestone for NWSL, making it the world's most significant professional women's soccer league in North America. The league has uh, has 12 current teams right now, including... uh, some of the teams like Portland Thorn, Houston Dash, and North Carolina Courage. Okay, some of the great, some of our greatest national team players play for some of these teams. Now, the expansion will bring the whole league to a total of 16 teams by 2026, by adding two more additional teams to the. Cur- I'm sorry, four additional teams to the current 12 franchises that we have. So they just added two more. Uh, from the uh, from the twelve that they had, I'm sorry, from the ten that they had, then they went to now they're currently at twelve, and they want to increase to sixteen by 2026. Which, again, it's more than possible because some of the cities that are uh, being talked about, uh, Nashville, 
uh, LA, uh, Seattle, um, uh, I believe New York was one of them. I don't know for adding another team. Uh, Dallas uh, wanted a team. Uh, Miami's talking about getting another team. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Now, the NWSL expansion plan is expected um, to positively impact the women's soccer uh, world in the United States and Canada, which is good. That, that's what you want. The lease expansion will provide more opportunities for female soccer players to play professionally and create more jobs in the soccer industry. Who doesn't want that? More women in sports, which is a positive. More jobs in the cities that want these teams. It will also increase the visibility and awareness of women's soccer, like I just said, which will help attract more fans and sponsors. More fans means more sponsors. More sponsors Sponsors need better accommodations, better accommodations, better players, better players, more fans, so on and so forth. Boom. Now, the NWSL has already received interest from several cities and potential team owners. So if anyone wants to get in like $1 million a piece, let's go get a, let's bring a franchise, another franchise to Texas. We all own her. We all get this stuff started. All right. All right. You know, uh, we'll get some great players. I know we could. But some of the cities that are interested in joining the league include Sacramento, Las Vegas, Louisville, San Diego. Uh, well, we already said San Diego is coming. It's already here. Uh, I know I've heard of Dallas being there. Um, <clears throat> uh, Nashville is another one. And I think St. Louis was another one that I read as well. So the NWSL expansion plan will allow the cities to showcase their love for soccer and support of women's sports. In other words, they're not just going to say, oh, it's Las Vegas. Yeah, here's a team. No, they're going to tell them, hey, you want a women's sports in your city? You got to freaking earn that shit. Hell yeah. I freaking love that. Because some of the cities have men's teams that are high, high, high price teams. Sacramento has the Kings. Las Vegas has the, uh, the Golden Knights, the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. You know, San Diego has the Padres. So, again... Which they already got a team, but either way, now Dallas has MLS plus a bunch of NHL, uh, NFL, amongst others. So again, really, really huge in this situation to say that, hey, you love soccer, you want to support women's sports, you better freaking show it. I love that about the plan. Now, for every positive thing, obviously, there's going to be challenges. One of the biggest challenges facing the NWSL plan is the need for more diversity and representation in the league. The expansion plan will provide an opportunity for the club to increase diversity and representation by bringing in more teams and players from different backgrounds. The expansion plan will allow the league to address some of its current, some of these in current, some of its, uh, can't even spoke right, some of these current challenges. In other words, more women bosses, more women head coaches, more women from you know, the rich side of the neighborhood and poor side of the neighborhood and middle class of the neighborhood and everyone playing with everyone, whether you're black, brown, pink, gay, lesbian, oh, well, I guess that's the same thing, uh, whatever other thing there are, if you're great at soccer and you love the sport, come and be represented here. That, that I like that. And that is a big challenge because... Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you deserve to be a head coach. Just because you're a woman and are, or a lesbian, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, you rep, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what's the word? You identify as, as lesbian doesn't mean that you are capable of running a business. And there are women out there who can run the shit out of these businesses who, who are amazing top tier talent and aren't getting representation like they should here. Another challenge facing uh, the NWSL is the need for more financial resources compared to other professional sport leagues in the United States. The expansion plan will allow the league to generate more revenue by adding new teams and sponsors, which will help uh, compete with the professional sports with other professional sports leagues. Again, more fans means more sports, more sponsors, more sponsors means better accommodations, better accommodations means more fans, so on and so forth. No more fans, greater talent coming to your city. I mean, come on, that's 
That's exactly what you need. I mean, plain and simple, right? Another challenge facing the NWSL is the need for more financial resources to compare to other professional sport leagues in the United States, such as MLS, NHL, NFL, uh, NBA, and so on, and even MLS. The expansion plan will allow the league to generate more revenue by adding new teams and sponsors. Again, this is hard to do, okay? But it's in doing. The NWSL's expansion plan has its challenges, and we know it. However, one of the biggest challenges will be ensuring that the new teams are competitive and can attract fans and sponsors. The league must ensure, and this is must ensure, that teams have the resources and supports they need to succeed on and off the field. And that's that's the biggest thing. Another challenge will be managing the logistics of a 16-team league. I put this last because although it is something that they have to do and they will need to ensure that the schedule is balanced and that teams are not required to travel extensively, it's not something that they can do. They will need to ensure, though, that the expansion remains with remains high with quality playing the league. And that's not that hard to do. I firmly believe that that's something that they can do. And... Honestly, we see it done all the time. The NFL does it, uh, does it, NHL, MLB, NBA, they all do it with 30 plus teams. That doesn't mean a 16 team can't be done. It might be a little bit harder. I would agree to that, but nothing that they can do. I firmly believe it that this is their least of their worries. It's just like the NBA does a generated schedule. Who says they can't do that as well? Computers, baby. Bam! They can do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but again, I, that's why I put it last. To me, this is not the biggest worry. I think diversity and everything else is so much more important. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, in conclusion, the NWSL 16-team expansion plan is a significant milestone for women's soccer in the United States and Canada. The expansion will provide more opportunities for female soccer players to play professionally, create more jobs in the soccer industry, increase the visibility of awareness and of women's soccer, and help the league address some of its current challenges. While the expansion plan is not without its challenges, the NWSL is way well positioned to manage them. I firmly believe that and ensure the league's continue, continued growth and, tr- and thrive. I, I am so excited to see this. And yeah, the panda, take us to our next thing. Thank you for that, panda. And as you guys see, this brings us to the end of another exciting episode of the Sporty Sibling Podcast. Today, we discuss some of the hottest topics in the world of sports, including the Brett Favre welfare case. The ongoing speculation about where Lionel Messi and Neymar were playing next. And the exciting expansion of the National Women's Soccer League. No, we truly started examining the Brett Favre welfare case, which has recently made headlines, like I said. It's with this serious, serious allegation. It's something that should be interesting to everyone. And we should see how this case develops in the coming days and weeks and months. And truly see the impact in and have a broader conversation about the welfare about welfare fraud, the effects on those on welfare, and the trust that we have on public figures figures, sorry, as such as Brett Favre. We also talked about you no know, you guys need to come back and tell me. Where do you think Neymar and Lionel Messi are gonna play? Both players are among the best in the world, we know that. Their futures are closely watched by everyone. So it's important that we keep discussing this. Tell me where you think they should go. Should they go to Germany? Should they go to MLS? Stay in Europe? Retire? Tell me what you guys think. And of course, we talked about the National Women's Soccer League expansion plan. With a lot of challenges facing in front of them, this is nothing that they cannot do. I firmly believe that they're going to be great 
they're going to grow and they're going to be one of the major powerhouses in powerhouses in women's sports. And I'm so excited to be able to watch this live and for my kids to one day be able to watch them and say, wow, we knew it before when it was cool. It's always been cool, but you know what I mean. It's just dynamic and I can't wait to see it grow. But at the end, today's episode covered various topics from welfare fraud to soccer in to women's sports. We have we hope that you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed discussing these critical issues with you. No, nope. we'll be back on Saturday, of course, with more analysis, interviews, and insight from the world of sports. So stay tuned. And also, do not forget to follow us on all social media from TikTok to Facebook to Instagram and everything else in between. And do not forget to watch us on Wednesdays like you are today on the RYM YouTube page and our, on Saturdays on Roku TV. Also, if you guys cannot watch the show because you guys are busy, we are also on all your major podcast websites. Please go out and look for it. All right. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.